Hey everyone, I'm Michael and today I want to show you what we have done to make the Directive API in Hot Chocolate so much simpler with version 13. So let's have a look at that. By the way, we are running workshops at several conferences throughout the year. So if you want to spend two days with Martin and me diving deep into GraphQL concepts, exploring what Hot Chocolate can do for you, and also diving deep into Relay and React, join us. If you like our content, please hit the like and subscribe button below the video. And with this, let's dive into some code. So this is our typical demo project with authors and books, and we're gonna introduce to it a couple of directives. What we wanna do here is introduce a new directive that tells us what roles are needed to execute a certain field. With version 13, we can now infer directives, like any other GraphQL type construct, right from your C-sharp code. So let's do that. So I'm introducing here a new class called needs permission. This class has one property called role, and that is my directive argument. This role property, we want to initialize from our constructor. So let me just introduce that. And next we need to mark it as a directive. So in this instance, our GraphQL engine would by default infer that as an object type because most classes will actually become object types in our GraphQL schema. But in this instance, I can mark that as a directive. Directive in GraphQL need to expose where they can be annotated on. I need to pass in here the directive location where this directive is valid on. It can be on multiple locations. So I could, for instance, say that a field definition is a valid location, but I also could say that a field is a valid location. A field refers to the field selection in a GraphQL query, whereas a field definition here refers to the field definition on the object type. In our case, we're going to get rid of this second one here, and it's only valid on field definitions. By the way, the field definition doesn't only refer to object types, it also refers to field definitions on interfaces. Okay, with this around, actually my directive is fully valid, I could use it, but in order to use it here in our C-sharp code, without the Fluent API, we would need to have an attribute to annotate that onto our resolver. So we could implement with our directive class here, actually the attribute, but I kind of like to have it separate. So we're gonna introduce here another class, needs permission attribute, and this will inherit in this case from the object field descriptor attribute. Then we're gonna override the onConfigure method of this attribute and get access here to the fluent type descriptor. So we can say descriptor.directive, and then we can just pass in our directive here. So we need here also now the property, and then we can pass that on. As I said, you could integrate these two classes into one and just have the needs permission here, and then this doubles as an attribute, but I kind of still like to have these separate. This is the configuration for the types, and this is really the pure directive object. So next we can use the permission attribute here and then can pass in the permission that is for instance needed to read this book here. So I'm saying here read book and then we're gonna go here into the book type and go to this author field here and also annotate it. And by the way, if, if you have a record and you just annotate this member here, you're actually annotating the parameter of the constructor. To get this attribute on the property of the actual gen generated class, you need to write property here. And then this property here is really put on the property of the generated class from this record. Okay, let's pass in here read author. And then we have annotated our directive to multiple places here. So what's cool with these directives is actually that we can inspect them in our schema. So I added here to our GraphQL server configuration two lines of code to print the schema into a file every time we start the server. So I'm retrieving essentially here the request executor that we configured here, and then I'm printing it out as a schema GraphQL. You can already see the file here. So when I run this thing, and I'm using .NET Watch here, so I don't have to care about it anymore, then it will update the schema here. So let's have a look at that. So you can see in my schema here, 
that we now nicely have exposed these type system directives. And that is really nice. You can see that you have applied configuration to a section in your graph. By the way, if we would look into banana cake pop here and go to schema definition, you cannot see these because the introspection doesn't expose where we have annotated certain directives. This is something where the spec group is still working on and figuring out how we do that the best way. But at the moment, this is not possible. But this is also a good thing because it kind of protects you of overexposing maybe internal information that you have annotated here. So you can have annotations, use them in unit tests to do a schema snapshot and see that you annotated in all the right spots, the right directives and see that configuration is there applied. But as soon as you publish your thing to production, it's gone. So at this point, this needs permission directive here doesn't do anything. So how can we make it do something? There are multiple ways. So we could write a type interceptor, look for where this directive is applied to, and then do stuff to that place. Maybe rewrite the configuration or things like that. The most predominant thing that you want to do is actually apply a middleware. So we can go back here to the need permission directive and just add another class here which, con which contains like the middleware logic. So if we use the fluent configuration, we could just add to the fluent configuration descriptor the use descriptor, which allows us to add a middleware. In this case, we don't have a fluent configuration here. This is really our directive. So we need to introduce another descriptor attribute here. And then like with our first attribute here, we get essentially a hook into the configuration of this directive. In our case, we want to introduce a middleware here. So I'm saying descriptor use. And now the middleware pattern is a bit different here. So usually we would start with next and then have the context there. In this case, we start with two parameters. We have next, that is the next invocable middleware segment. And then we get a handle on the directive here. So the directive that we have here is not actually the captured thing here. So it's not directly the instance here, but it's kind of a meta object where I can inspect certain things. For instance, I could look at the type, the directive type that I have in my type system. I also could have a look at the target. Where is it annotated to? But I also can get the representation here. So I could capture the actual directive instance. And I would capture it here in the first delegate, since then you don't have to do the cast or if it, if it was annotated in schema first, the serialization process just once. So we kind of say, give me, give me that instance here. And then we capture it here in the first delegate. And then we would create a second delegate. And this delegate is the actual middleware. So this is async. And then we can do our logic here. In this case, we do a very simple middleware. So if our context, we get the user from our context, and then we do a simple is in role check. And for that, we take our directive here. There we have the role. If our user has this role, we just invoke the next delegate here. And if not, we just throw an error. By the way, if we wanted to mess with the HTTP status code here, we could do that. I don't recommend that, but it's an often asked question. So we could do that here by using the result builder. And there we can set the global state. And we have these well-known context data. This is state we can to inject into our result object or in other places. And we have one for status code, so we can mess with it without getting actually a handle on the actual context. And then we would maybe do a 401 here. Awesome, so that is our middleware. And we want the directive to essentially copy that to each field that is annotated with the directive here. So we're gonna add this middleware attribute onto our directive and then it attaches itself to the directive type. One cool aspect here is that in the program CS, we never registered the directive. So there is no directive type. You can also see here, we don't have to annotate that anywhere. And even the source generator doesn't have to pick it up because we only will register it if it's annotated at least in one place in our schema. So we don't have this double registration that we used to have where if you're doing it with the Fluent API. So let's try it out. So I have Banana Cake Pop opened. Now we can just dive into our book field and get the author. If I run that, you can see I get a 401 because I don't have the rights to execute that. 
That's awesome. So in order to get access here, really, I would need to implement authentication logic. I'm not going to do that. This was more an example to show you how easily you can add middlewares with directives to things and even have it inspectable in the schema. You could also do that with type interceptors, but it's not observable in the SDL. Okay, let's have a look at one more aspect here. And I'm actually deactivating the middleware that we already wrote. Then we introduce another directive here and we call it to upper. In this case, we want this directive to be applicable in the query itself. So we say field and then actually rewrite this middleware down here to the two upper middleware and we rewrite the logic a bit. We actually don't need to capture the directive here. We just want to mess with the result. So if the field I annotated my directive to returns a string, we're going to uppercase it. Update the context.result here take the string but in this case we need to run the next delegate before we do this manipulation okay that looks nice we can discard this actually and then uh, it should have been recompiled now let's go to my browser let's just run that to see if everything works yes everything works fine let's refresh the schema let's have a look at the schema definition and you can see i have this to upper directive here. So the to upper directive will be always registered even if we don't use it on a field definition because this is meant for the query. So I can now go here to the name and say to upper and then this will change how a name is executed. There could be other things like translation logic or what have you and you would give your query writer a certain control over the execution of this query. So if I run that, you can see John Skeet is now to uppercase. As I said, that is my default example for this kind of thing. But uh, I saw in the wild things like translation directives where you could say, okay, if there is a translation for the field result into Spanish, then translate it and give me the translated value back just as an idea. So there could be other use cases for this kind of thing. So what do you think? The API was fundamentally simplified. You essentially write a class now and then you can annotate this directive anywhere in your schema or just use it like here in your query. In general, directives was the last old API where we just had a code first API for, but no annotation based variant. Now we are essentially feature complete on that level and we will iterate a bit more on that. Like I would like to integrate the middleware in an easy way into the actual directive class without the need to write an attribute for it. But already the new directive API feels much nicer and again uses less code to express what you want to do. If you want to help our project, please go to GitHub and give us a GitHub star so that this project grows further and we get even more people into the community. With this, I see you next time.